I'm the facilitator, so I have a list of things to do. I hit record, and now I'm going to share my screen with the question for this breakout room. Um, okay, can you see, can you all see that question? I'll leave it up for a little mm -hmm. bit and then take it down once we kind of have it in our heads. I'll also so, put it in the chat, Katie. Oh, yes, that would be great. Am I doing that? That way we can, depending on how many screens everyone has, it's kind of nice to see each other's boxes sometimes. Um, but our question for the breakout room is how do you convey the value that you add? So this is from the university perspective to industry partners or potential industry partners. And I see we lucked out. We have some experts in this breakout room. I'm sure more than I already know about, but we have Paul Lowe with us who directs pre-award services and represents the university on the university industry demonstration partnership. So um, I'm excited to have you in here, Paul. And also, oh, our, you. yeah, you said you work with Cali. Is that right? Or you're trying to work with Cali? No, we, we, we do work uh, together already. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Going on, yeah. So this is a wonderful example. I'm glad that you two ended up in this room together. Um, so maybe if anybody doesn't have any other ideas for how to kind of start the session, I think it would be wonderful to hear Callie and our nod, how you two connected and Callie, how you conveyed your value to him um, in order to start working together. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, Arno, uh, do you want to take uh, take first? Yeah, please. No, maybe maybe you can you can you can go. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So Arno and uh, me actually met in a conference, and uh, we were uh, looking for technology on uh, lab scale milling. You know, at K State, uh, we have a milling science program, and we do have all the lab scale mills that are available in the world. But uh, Chopin Mill is something that we don't have uh, at house. And uh, then we, I went to AACC conference and there I met with Arnau saying that, you know, Arnau, this is the research we are doing. And these are the small projects that we, you know, currently my students are working on. And uh, we would like to have a partnership with you. Uh, you know, but at this point of time, you know, we, we really don't have the amount of dollars that... Uh, you know, that we require to buy the lab scale mill. So that's how the conversation started. Then Arnav mentioned that, you know, he's also looking for a partner on in terms of technology side on how we can collaborate uh, and improve the lab scale mill that they developed. And uh, that's how the partnership started. And uh, thanks to the pre-awards uh, office, you know, we, we signed a, a formal memorandum for understanding, you know, and uh, with that MOU, we got the lab scale mill as a donation to our lab. And every year uh, we kind of meet at the ACC conference and check out what should be done with the lab scale mill and or what we are doing with the lab scale mill and what are our suggestions that we can do go on. And uh, that's our first initiation. But uh, at this point of time, K-State actually hosts more than seven or eight equipment that are donated by Chopin. And, uh, you know, they are, they are worth of millions of dollars already. So that's how it started. Wow. Wow, that's great. That's an excellent story. Or not, do you have anything to add about kind of how Kelly communicated his value to you? It sounds like it was just the right place, the right time. And I know that from past experiences, um, some working with industry boot camps that Paulo and I have been involved in, faculty say conferences are a wonderful way. They always give that as an example to connect with industry partners. So no, no, no that's that's Definitely an ex an excellent example. Now I, I I just want to warn you: do not think we are donating all the tools like that. It's not like what we are doing. You're gonna uh, get not... hit up hard after this, right? You're like, no. <laughs> I'm just I'm just afraid to have too many requests. And uh, <laughs> no, but but seriously, that that really comes to a moment with where where it's important when when we are launching a new product or having something new. Of course, we can make a lot of communications and, and social networks and, and all of that. But it, it gives a very different way if, if it's something coming from outside the company and, and even more when it's recognized. So that's clear for us. K-State is up high 
and and that's that's a real good value and and i really want to thank uh kelly for what they have been doing i've seen recently the publications that that's really interesting and that's something we are using after to show the people say okay look what we can do with the tools um and and these are very very good partnerships now we always want to do more and and one thing sometimes we are a little bit um let's say um a hard point of it is that sometimes and we understand why the works which are done at a very high level which is good but at the same time we would like to have things which are a little bit more uh, like applicative work and the things that looks quite obvious but but I can tell you the industry is missing this kind of information. When you are going to IAOM meetings and this kind of thing, they, they, they require things which are very, they look trivial, but that's their daily business. So that's, we try to find a way of balancing the two things, having very fundamental work on our tools, but also something which is more accessible to the people. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's interesting. Would you say that the work that K-State is doing on your um, equipment is fundamental in nature then, or is it? We we had both. Uh, I have seen the, 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 the latest paper. I, I have to say when I heard the first thing and when we spoke with, with Kelly the first time, he was looking about uh, bacteria on the wheat and how it is contam contaminating the wheat. I did not understand why. Uh, then I read the paper and, and now I know why, I understand why. So it, it was fundamental for me at the beginning, but then I, I found it quite um, quite very practical at, at the end. But but sometimes, yes, I, I, you have some papers which are necessary, but very, very high level. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's also interesting. We had some great work done with... Uh, I don't remember which part of K-State, but they have been doing a study with the, with the pilot mill, with the Bueller pilot mill and looking about starch damage and, and different streams and things like that. This is also kind of thing which are extremely important for us because that's a way of showing what, what is done in K-State and, and the people are really looking at that. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you find it effective when you receive, like you'd mentioned, Cali had supplied, you'd read his paper and it helped yeah. you understand some fundamental work. Do you, when you're first initially um, creating a relationship with a faculty member, do you find value in receiving publications? Um, would it, okay. I know that um, some industry have suggested, you know, a, like a one page kind of a shorter version for initial conversations, demonstrating kind of capabilities and topic areas as opposed to CVs and publications. Um, but it's good to know that you you find value in the publications as well. Yes, we, we do. And what we try to do sometimes, because we know everybody do not read all the papers, uh, what we try to do as much as we can is at least to make a kind of poster that we can present during conferences or things like that, which is a summary yeah. of that. It, it is working also very good. Great. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing that. I'm glad that the technology wizards were on our side today, putting you both in the same breakout room. Um, unless somebody has comments about that or questions for Anad and Callie, I was going to kick it over to Paul to see what thoughts you might have on this question of conveying your value as a university faculty member to industry partners. Yeah, and um, what I was interested in hearing and during that, uh, we call it the ideation stage or, you know, when we did our, our boot camp, one second, I got to show you this. Ooh, that's a keeper. <laughs> I see that. I recognize that binder. That's our curriculum. We did a, uh, this was a seven part series over an entire semester that we uh, uh, we developed for uh, working with industry boot camp here at K-State for our faculty. We really need to do it again. And we hear uh, industry uh, input, and Katie was alluding to that from some don't want to see a scientific paper. So I, I but I appreciate that your your perspective on that. Uh, some want like an elevator speech, want a more uh, a condition or honed. You know, they they really want us to do our research first. So that's my question: Is Callie, how how did you know how to bridge that gap between the fundamental and the application? Because uh, yeah, I can see Arnaud being skeptical. 
skeptical saying, so what? Right? How can you solve a problem for us? And, and so that's what we hear from industry versus I'm going to write a USDA grant. I'm going to go uh, go and create new knowledge, you know, that gets disseminated throughout the world. I have the industry saying, what can you do for me? How, you know, how do you, how did you find out what problem uh, uh, that are not needed solved? Um, no, that, that basically comes from my industry experience. So I had a, I had a, quite a bit of two years, three years of industry experience. And uh, when I came to K-State, actually as a PhD student, I used to work on industry projects. And uh, those are those are something that, that I thought to, uh, really important because they need the solution immediately. And, you know, working with that pace, you know, immediate solution and which are, which are, you know, uh, it is like really, you know, the product will be available immediately as well. Like, whereas if I do, if I'm doing some fundamental research and if, if I write a USD and EFA proposal, it might take five to 10 years to get that on board. Whereas here working with industry folks and Arno, he's, he's in the industry from last 35 years and you know, picking his brain and getting the ideas, you know, is, is, is worth for us, like, you know, on how to approach. So so that's how we started this. Yeah. yeah, we use the term in our boot camp, working at the speed of industry. And we yeah. have to find that balance between balance, your yeah. academic uh, you know, requirements, uh, supervising your students, your, 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 your teaching, and be realistic about those timelines up front. Uh, or not, how do you, or do you uh, do you understand that that paradigm that you know when you do approach a project, and I understand I appreciate colleagues, you need an immediate uh you know, uh, response, you know, so, I mean, uh, you know, and, and need to get that into the product or at least into your literature if it's uh, helps prove a claim. Uh, but how do you balance that knowing what his, uh, the academic uh, rigor is for, for our faculty who has, you know, they're, they're kind of like pulled in different directions. How do we deal well, with it, that? Yeah, that, that's, that, that's something um, because of course, when, when I when I come to my bosses and I say, okay, you need to give me a, a meal because I want to, I want to to make a donation to K State, they just look at me and they say, no way. Uh, mm. Why? Why should we do that? And, and and that's that's the big question. I need to be able to bring them the value that they are going to have, okay. which is in term. Okay, you are investing. You are not making a donation. You are investing. Um, and and uh, and first of all, the name. Uh, of course, if you're doing that in 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 Manhattan, that's that's giving some some plus. And then after we need and and we had a lot of discussion when we made the first contract about okay, what are we going to provide? And and again, the thing is to be able to find a way of of providing things that my bosses will understand. It is an immediate value, which can be something maybe less interesting from the academic point of view. Uh, but also agree that we might have academic work that can make it take longer. So it's finding the right balance. Uh, so we can give the investors something to eat. And at the same time, uh, having you have the whole benefit of the, of, the, of, the, of the device and in our case, and make research with that. So yeah, that's, that's a fine line where we need to find the balance. And and we are still we are still trying our best to catch the industry speed. We we still didn't catch there. Yeah, no, no problem. We trust you. <laughs> well, I, we use that term, the value proposition, and I think it's important to be able to demonstrate what that value proposition is. And I think we all have to do that within our own organizations, within our own little world that we reside in. Uh, you know, and so that's an important concept. You know, we know we can help each other. It's like we need to be able to to uh, uh, convey that in a, a in a clear manner. You know, that really convinces somebody to to make a, a contribution of that equipment, understanding that you know there is a, a a downside to that. Where there here's the benefit, and be able to to explain that. So. Renata, I'm curious um, if student talent came into play at all with your engagement um, with K-State, because that's something we've heard. I know, Paul, a lot from our UIDP, our University Industry Demonstration Partnership, that's universities and industry, that companies constantly say that student talent is a big reason they engage at all. So conveying that value. Oh, we have one minute. So I really didn't give anybody else time. I'm sorry. <laughs> but 
I just got a notification. We have one minute. So I don't know, Arnaud or Callie, if you want to speak to that quickly and then we can see if there are other questions. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, for me, like, you know, I, as I always tell my students that, you know, hey, my career is set. So it's your turn now to take the lead. So whenever, like, you know, are now and here, uh, Dr. Hikmat Boyanchilu, who is who works with KPM, you know, for the US division, you know, they 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 are in constant touch with him. Like, you know, on how, how we are using, what is coming out and what is missing. Actually, that that is actually helpful for students also because they are working in the academia, but, you know, working with the industry pace. So that actually helps students a lot. Yeah, my, my two, two students who worked on this project, they actually got into uh, uh, got in, uh, got into placement already. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. great. Yeah. Well, are there any, I imagine we just have a few seconds, but are there any questions or comments from the group about conveying value to industry partners or last thoughts from Arnaud? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're picking on you. <laughs> okay, we're getting switched, I think. It was great. I really enjoyed Thank this you. and learned a lot. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Thanks, Arnaud. Hello, everyone. I think this is our new group. Are were some of you? Were all of you together? And RJ and I are new. Yeah. Okay. We're, here. we're the new ones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you all have gotten to know each other. Okay. Great. Well, we have brought a new question to discuss. I'm sure that you've had great conversation already. And I kind of heard as you were talking a question about notes. I know that RJ um, is capturing takeaways from all of our different groups. And so we will be sure and share those with Maureen after this. So, um, okay, so can everyone see, I think RJ put it in the chat, but our question is how do you convey the value that you add to industry? So this is referring to a faculty member from inside the university conveying their value um, to an industry partner. Um, and I can just share uh, a quick summary of the last breakout room, if it's helpful to kind of get the conversation going. But we were lucky to have Arnaud, one of our um, industry representatives, and Callie from Grain Science, who worked together um, in that same breakout room. So they were sharing kind of how Callie communicated his value. And one way he did that was first connecting um, at a conference. So that's something that we've heard in past sessions where we have faculty panels about that have a lot of industry connections. And it's like, how do you even first make the connection, which I think might be another question that you've already um, discussed. But one of the keys is going to different conferences. And then um, Callie had an immediate need for his lab. He wanted a lab scale, some lab scale milling equipment. I don't actually know anything about how all that works. So I hope I'm not butchering this, but, and that makes sense. Um, and Arnaud was really interested in Cali because of K-State's green science reputation. He had known about it um, previously and they kind of just started discussing problems in the industry and things that were going on. And Cali was able to provide him with some of his publications. Um, and so that kind of started their relationship and connection and then um, a donation um, to Callie's lab that is still ongoing today. So that was kind of the focus of our last conversation. Um, I don't know, Sean, we're lucky to have you in this uh, breakout room. I don't know if you kind of want to start things off by telling us what you think is the best way for faculty to, if they were to approach you, um, to convey their value to you. Yeah, um, a couple things. Uh, one thing I, I mentioned in the pre previous breakout was this job to be done approach. So I don't really want to mention that again. But um, two things that recently I've have caught my attention. I've actually been been actually learned quite a bit from these 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 research groups. One was a a food science professor <clears throat> at the University of Guelph actually just put on her own little day long. Um, seminar of her her students research and and in the current needs or current directions of the lab and really broke it down just like a you know similar seminar you would go to in a, a a conference and I thought the style was great and I learned a lot and there's some you know definitely some things that were applicable to to the work I'm doing so um you know I'm just saying you don't have to wait for a an 
uh, annual meeting to have a pre you know present you can actually kind of organize and organize your own now that we have zoom and anything else that's that's um very easy to use and secondly there's been some podcasts that were put on by by university departments lately that i've really um been drawn to one is a uh, it's called like the Wheat Beat podcast that uh, Washington State uh, Crop Science does, and they actually do a lot of really good short interviews of faculty. And it, um, I'm not sure if K-State has something similar, but but getting those things front and center in, in, in terms of industry um, have been useful for me the last uh, few months. How did you find out about that food science professor you mentioned, the seminar she put on and the podcast? Was it yeah. just kind of organically or? Yeah, the... um. Um, the seminar that the faculty put on, I actually knew her. She was a PhD student, um, at the university in, in Belgium during my postdoc. So, um, I, I got onto some listserv that she has. So she's kind of blasted out this invitation to, to her, her industry connections. And that's how, how I heard about that. I think the podcast, I just stumbled upon it, um, looking for something interesting around on wheat and that popped up. So the AI wizards exactly. like yeah. it. <laughs> great for sure okay yeah I was curious because I know it's hard with um there's so many sources of information that everybody's getting notified a lot and we get asked to do a lot of things and so I was curious how they kind of broke through the noise and it sounds like maybe the first one it definitely helped that you had a personal relationship Absolutely. as well yeah, yeah. great and it's a fairly small industry I mean grain science isn't very big so. right Great. That makes sense. Are there any other, I know we have several um, faculty member on this call who collaborate with industry regularly. Um, and I'm curious if, if any of you want to share kind of how you've conveyed your value in the past and strategies that might be helpful for the rest of the group. I could put some on the spot. Katie, this is Jim Gerlard. Great. Uh, Perfect, Jim. I was going to do put you on the spot. <laughs> I, I would say that a lot of times our, our conversations begin with just the, the breadth of expertise uh, here at the university. So, um, you know, I have a, kind of a specific uh, range of, of capabilities um, uh, within my repertoire, but uh, you know, I'm just down the hall from somebody with a very different expertise and a building away from somebody else with uh, uh, another type of expertise. And so we can uh, form collaborative groups to solve relatively complex problems. And I would say that that's just something that um, doesn't exist within many corporations, especially smaller ones. Um, they just don't have the financial resources to have uh, all of the different areas of expertise that we would um, have within the university system. So the trick is organizing the people um, uh, toward that um, that single task. And so, um, but I would say that's one of the key areas that we try to convey um, is is just the the broad range of uh, personnel that we have and their expertise that they bring to the table. You specifically, Jim, kind of hunt out or work with companies that maybe because you are a researcher with specific expertise, do you look for companies that maybe our units don't have in-house R&D, you know, they're maybe smaller and they want to outsource kind of like, uh, Sean, I believe you'd mentioned that, that you are smaller, you're not going to do the plant breeding genetics on your own. Um, I didn't know if that was part of your strategy, Jim. Yeah, I would say it, it maybe uh, in some cases. I mean, there's been a couple of local companies that we've um, uh, worked with that, um, you know, have had very specific uh, problems, but have limited personnel. And so uh, we've approached them about about uh, 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 trying to resolve some of those issues for them. Um, but then I could tell you that one of our recent interactions has been with Bayer um, on a GMO event that they you know, was developed within Monsanto more than a dozen years ago, um, that we see an application within the animal area um, that they had not anticipated. Um, and so we're we're trying to revive that technology, you know, within a, a monster organization like Bayer. And so they would have a lot of expertise, um, but not necessarily a lot of animal expertise. Right. 
So, um, yeah, we bring uh, something quite different to the party. And so very early on in that, I I reached out to other colleagues, you know, in the swine and dairy and poultry and brought them into the loop just so, um, you know, we could um, uh, convey uh, that image of, of having, you know, very broad range of expertise in the animal agriculture. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Anyone else um, on the call have thoughts or, or questions? Brian, you know I'm going to pick on you. Okay. <laughs> no, that's right. Actually, I was just going to extend, extend on what Jim said. I think most people, you know, when they hear animal science, they might not think of the small animal science department, which is entomology, because we might have a, right, a different <laughs> perspective to that conversation, which is, well, what about you know, insects as alternative protein sources, how are you thinking about the impacts of these particular lines on decomposition and maybe other, again, other use cases where, you know, that might, might, that might then turn into this whole new business adventure because you haven't really thought about insects, the role they play, if not just from the disease transmission standpoint, but also like nutrient cycling and all this other stuff. And if you're adding a new thing to the system, what, what's the, what are some of those effects down the chain? And so like I can, I was in a conversation with, you know, John Deere, not wasn't, I wasn't the primary invite, but this goes back to the last question is like, I just put myself in places where I kind of, kind of try to make the stretch in my mind. If I can make a connection though, I try to be there to provide that kind of what, what if, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to interpret data, you know, it's like, every, it seems like every 10th plant or whatever is like not necessarily showing something that we would expect. And I'm like, well, that makes sense to me because you're probably planting a refuge in a bag and every plant, every 10th plant or whatever is probably susceptible to bugs. Therefore, you're not going to get the same response. And they're all going, oh, again, hadn't really thought about that. So again, when you talk about value, it's really not just trying to push your research agenda, but it's also trying to make your research agenda stretch a bit to kind of make some of those connections. And to me, that's how, you know, how I convey that value is like, you're, th you're not thinking about these things. I know that's kind of what others had said, but it's really, you really kind of have to put yourself in that position to make it stretch first before getting them to see that. So I guess that's how I kind of maybe approach a conversation is, well, here's some, here's some other things that you're probably not on the forefront of your brain, which insects are, I get it, um, but they are- Except in the summer with mosquitoes. Except in the right? summer, exactly. <laughs> yeah, great, thanks, Brian. Do you find that putting yourself, like conveying your value, that that is, you've been able to do that because of your relationships across campus with other expertise? Like Jim kind of mentioned, I have a certain expertise and then down the hall is this and, you know, the other building over is this. Is that kind of the best way to make sure that you're someone who's in the room and at the right place at the right time? Or do you kind of have in your back pocket some you know, a one pager about Brian McCormick and the things he can do for industry or has done for industry? Uh, to me, to me, it's just kind of about mindset and approach. And it's like, you know, I, I have a hard time saying no to meetings just because I'm trying to learn, trying to understand what those connections are, listening to the, you know, the industry members at the table, what kind of things are they really thinking about? And then going, okay, what, what could be some things that might provide some added value? Maybe not now, but again, it goes back to some of the other things I said is like, 4% of the grants hit. And so some of the things that I'm saying, connections I'm making are not making sense now, but you know, in a couple of years where the industry starts to shift and it's like, oh yeah, that one person was there. Then I, mm. it, it's really amazing. You'll get, you'll start to get some of these contacts that are, that are later, but you end up being invited more to the conversation. If you try to provide some like connections to what they're interested in versus like, I have this thing to tell you that I want you to. Gotcha. Pick up. And so it's, that's why I said, it's more about a mindset of how I approach those meetings. And I don't know, it also helps me with grant writing too. So. Right. Right. Thank you. Well, that's that's just, really that's helpful. Just me. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Any other thoughts, Philip? I know that you do a lot of work um, with industry regularly in your um, role at the university. I don't know if you have any insight to how you make those connections and provide value. Sorry, to put you on the spot. Yeah, well, I don't know that I would say I have a lot of industry connections. Um, we do have some connections just because I'm part of the BCI, and so we have right. some established connections there. Um, and to just ask, I guess, 
what a I guess one of my kind of a question. Um, you know, I can you know ask or I can talk to somebody that I meet and just kind of what I'm doing and what's going on in our research group. Um, but then how do you try to move that from just a conversation about here's what we're doing, here's what's going on to hey, are you guys interested in funding a project in you know whatever area or without interest you in in your um r d budget or 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 per portfolio for this year or next year how do you how, how do you kind of move that conversation without i guess maybe without seeming like you're being pushy i think without asking being... questions like like what what kind of projects do you guys typically fund with with universities but how what are your, your interactions with universities um, I mean, some of the funding that we 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 do with, with universities isn't a direct funded at the university. It's through like some federal public private partnerships. So looking for some things like that. Um, um, yeah, and also understanding the the you know this might seem very basic, but the budgeting cycle of companies, right? So our company cycle budget is um, September one um, is the start of our fiscal budget. So knowing when when the talk about research is also important too. So we're talking about what things are we doing June and July uh, that we're going to fund. So um, getting to know a little bit more about companies and their their financial um, budgets and, and timing is important too. Because you know I've had projects um, come to me in in October that you know were interesting, but there's no way I could fund them for for the next year. Um, and then projects that come in in June that I could immediately fund because of that. So. That's a great point, Sean. And I think a lot of companies use the calendar year funding. And so they're all kind of different. Maybe maybe there are some industry standards that would be. I know it's, it's also difficult for, there's always that rub, I feel like, between companies typically being on an annual budget and, and pivoting sooner. So universities are kind of our bread and butter is, you know, a longer term federal grant that can get a no cost time extension and fund graduate students for their entire program. And we don't have to, you know, have too much anxiety once we get the award about that graduate student not having funding for their entire tenure. Whereas companies typically, it seems like, especially for an initial project, really like the one year projects. And that can, that can put faculty in a difficult spot for graduate students and if they're going to put a student on the project. And also upfront discussions of, uh, I'm sure you'll not really appreciate, but overhead costs, right? So I think knowing that ahead of time is important. Like what are the standards? What are the minimums mm -hmm. that we can get through? But uh, sometimes that's caught people off guard. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have a, um, from previous faculty panels and, and boot camps and things, we have a kind of two questions that you need to be ready to answer when you're talking to an industry partner, especially if it's about sponsored research. So Sean, you brought up a good point that maybe a sponsored project isn't the route that that company typically goes. So they, that would be new territory. Maybe they're looking at an equipment donation or they're looking at some other, you know, in-kind, you know, materials or something like that to support your work. Um, but if you are talking sponsored research, two things to know the answer to are, how much is it gonna cost? And along with that, what's your overhead? And then what's your intellectual property policy? Yep. Yeah, and buying equipment is a lot easier than funding projects for me. So I've bought lots of equipment for, for faculty members. So. Careful, you might get a lot of emails after this. <laughs> or what's the best way to yeah, 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 yeah. relay yeah. our value to you? <laughs> exactly. And I think the one thing more is that I don't know, it, it may not you know apply to many other people, but uh, when you were saying, so continue to evolve, you know, we are doing some things now which we have never done. So we have no image analysis, computer vision AI guys. So I think personally, we recognize that uh, going forward, if you want to work with ags, you know, machinery or machine systems automation, if you don't have AI, if you don't have computer vision, if you don't have capability to build uh, hardware systems, you will not be mainstream who people are looking for funding. So if that is what is needed, so we have gone from no person to five people doing only AI computer vision. So guess what? Now 
we have a portfolio to present to people in terms of what we are doing. Suddenly, people who have never thought about us as these kind of projects, they say, no, 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 we are going there because they have, we have published. So I am, again, I, I cannot um, say less about good publications, which can pave the way because they are proof of, you know, your work that you have successfully started on a problem. And, and, and this comes back to the question now we're supposed to be answering, which is how do you convey the value? Yes. Um, and I think we already talked some of that a little bit. Um, yes. Great. So, and you all have been in the same group the whole time. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So RJ and I are new to the conversation. Yeah. So, but I will share that in the first group we were in, they were also speaking to that very thing, AJ, about one way you provide value is publications that are relevant to the industry. So something they're going to read, it helps solve a problem or address a question that they've been wondering about yeah. to, to kind of cement your expertise. So there's two, there's two things I would say to that, two examples I would say. One is, as I said earlier, make that, do the preparation, look at your strengths and your weaknesses, because if they ask you to do something you can't do, you say, well, either I know somebody else who can do that, I mm. can help you with, or yep. I can maybe develop that, but don't claim you can do stuff you can't do because that's going to get you in trouble. So the other thing is, um, as I say, how do you convey the value? And it just struck me just when you were talking about publications as one particular area that may not think about, and that is, um, for instance, I just went to a, a meeting in Berlin on, on, it's on detection of genome editing products, but, and I was a keynote speaker there. But the point was, I was giving a talk on a problem that's a, a hot issue right now, right? And I've been publishing on that for the last two years. And that's the reason I ended up being the keynote speaker. So think strategically about what, what are the problems in your field? And maybe you want to take the slide down so we can all see each other oh, now. Yes, sorry about that. Yep. Just remind you to do that because I know we agreed to do Thank that. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, I started looking at that in 2016, okay, six years ago. Finally, uh, you know, but if you were to give a talk at a meeting that addressed a key industry issue, strategic issue usually, then the chances of you being contacted or approached or being able to talk to these people are higher. So that's one of the publication things that you may not think about when you think about publishing is, yes, there's a hard science, there's a, a nitty-gritty, and I mean, I've done that um, as much as anybody. Um, but on the other hand, what are the strategic issues in your field that might be important? And we heard about weed science earlier on. Um, we've heard, there's a few people we haven't heard from. I don't know what, if you want to speak up or you're shy. Um, but, the, you know, the, that's one of the things you can do is to think about, well, not only what's the little tiny details, but maybe come up for air. And there's a great uh, woman called Melissa Marshall, who you might want to look at her presentation skills, how to, you know, it's, uh, she did a, um, a whole bunch of stuff on, on communicative science. And one of the things she says is, you may want to go down in the weeds, you might say, or not weeds as the case may be with, um, with Hila, but the, the point is the ordinary person you're going to be talking to looking for funding is not going to go down in those weeds. And, and she likens it to scuba diving. They don't have tanks on their back, right? They don't have a snorkel. So if you're going to go down and get really detailed, it's going to get out of the thing. So when you're communicating, you've got to communicate the big picture, not the tiny details, right? You've got to, you've got to say, this is why it's important. I'm working on this area. This is what we can do. And this is why it's important. And this is how it's strategically important, how it can help you in five years from now. Rather than going, and I see a lot of academic, I see, I go to meetings and I see people talking and they're talking about the very details of what they're doing, which is fine. It depends on the session, but in the major sessions, if you want to get really interested you know, in with the industry, it's not, you know, the the time yeah presenting the science that's it great the great place to look have a look at that um that will really help you in thinking about not being on the bottom of the ocean but coming up for air and showing people 
where it matters to them because they're not they're, they're not going to be an expert in your field yeah so if you're communicating that's one of the things you can try and do does somebody who's not spoken yet want to want to speak up if not i suggest you go to toastmasters and do some training <laughs> i'm sorry i'm a, I'm a 20-year toastmaster nearly and uh, it's you know as somebody who gives a lot of presentations it's really important to practice that and to get feedback okay so that's one of the reasons i do that look into it so i'm livia olson um, okay. i'm a science librarian here on campus mm -hmm. and i work primarily with agriculture yeah. um, and so we work with our industry a little bit different than the way people in other departments mm -hmm. do um, because our industry really likes us to sell us expensive things and it's a very changing landscape in academic publishing and yeah. um, our different academic um, library services providers. Um, and so I feel like a lot of times we're trying to hide from our industry partners um, because we know that they have a sales pitch they want to give us always. Yeah. Um, but we work um, hard to try to like get the best things that we can for our university community while also sort of conveying um, you know, how we can help them as, as people who are publishing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I feel like we're sort of in the middle. We're not, we're not working with industry in the same way, but we do work with industry. So. Yeah. And it's, I understand that I'm, I say I'm on the board of best cereals and grains and that, you know, that organizations and, and others organizations I've been involved with associations always struggling with this, the way that publishing is changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is really a challenge, and you'll see, you know, you see newspapers going out of business because they can't do make that change. And um, I know a lot of smaller associations are actually allying with some of the big publishing companies because that's the only way they can do it. Um, so it is, it is a changing area. Um, the question is, um, is there any way that organizing, you know, that's, that departments like you can can offer a service to? industry partners in terms of uh helping them find stuff i know i, I remember when i had i had to go back and find a, a method for something and I ended up going back to the 19 9, 1910s uh german scientific literature i had a librarian with me because it's the only way i could have got back there so there are skills you have that maybe are not understood or not well understood by management or industry it may be more better understood by the people who's doing research yeah that's really true um i feel like the students um that i hear the most from on campus about how do they get access to the scholarly literature after yeah. they've graduated are in like grain science and food science and meat science they're in all those departments mm -hmm. um and so you know, I try and communicate what they can do after they leave the university and they no longer have access to the things that we pay for. Um, but yeah, I, I don't want this conversation to get too too far off track. So um, if anyone else has something to say. Well, I think I think library sciences are undervalued, personally. But that's my opinion. <laughs> you probably like to hear that. <laughs> Anybody else? I'll so just... Go ahead. I was just going to hop on and say, so Kate Nelson, I'm actually from geography, and so I'm probably mm -hmm. the only social scientist uh, in this group, um, and study really things like uh, community resilience, uh, social mm -hmm. vulnerability, and inequity-based issues, um, particularly associated with uh, sustainable ag transformation. Mm -hmm. um, so really, I'm just kind of here to learn. I have no interaction with industry so far uh zero <laughs> um so um the sustainability yeah, just, right now is a big deal yeah yeah um oh, yeah, yeah. i suppose that's one of the things where it's um trying to identify where where and who and to what extent uh people uh, industry are are interested yeah, so we, in actual research associated with it yeah we well so we have a we have a um uh director of sustainability in north america at bsf 
Um, her job is to figure this out. Uh, so, uh, and maybe, maybe uh, you know, you could send me an email and I can send it on to her. Um, that could be, you know, she may be interested. She was at the uh, Sears and Grains meeting last summer and made a lot of contact, was very interested in what was going on. So, um, yeah, and the other, the other area that sustainability is really focused in um, and in equity is in the um, standard setting area and in the, um, I know in, there's a smart farming, for instance, and there's another group I'm involved in at IEC, and ISO is International Standards Organization, IEC is a similar organization, they're looking at digitalization of agriculture. And one of the areas is supply chains and inequity in blockchain systems. So that's another area that's interesting. So it's, it's, there's a lot of interesting sustainability issues and inequity issues within, uh, at least within the agriculture industry, because it's such a diverse industry with small farmers, big farmers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So maybe you know, send me your, send me, I put my LinkedIn uh, information in there. Um, and actually I put my orchid as well, because I thought it might be interesting. Uh, but, yeah. um, or okay. uh, I'm sure Katie can send you the email address. So, yeah. uh, it, and I'm retiring on Friday, so don't send me my BSF one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But do it before Friday so I can pass it on to Jessica. Um, all right, all right. Yeah. But there is, there is interest you, in the industry. So, I mean, that's it. It's a, we just had a conversation, right? This is a typical kind of conversation you may have uh, that completely off the wall that you didn't, and you'd say, well, you know, how do I get this to, well, Here's somebody who can put you in touch with somebody. Whether it comes comes out to be anything, I don't know, but at least you've made that connection. So that goes back to the first question we had: How do you make connections? And the, it's it's sorry. Sometimes it's serendipity. You know, I went to a I went to a, a thing on carbon farming at uh, a carbon uh, accounting at NC State University because it sounded interesting, and. You know, I met with some students that were doing tissue culture, which was back doing the stuff that I was doing a long time ago. Um, it's completely serendipity, but for them it was valuable because we could talk about this stuff. So, mm. you know, get out there, go to weird things you didn't expect to go to, and you never know who you might meet. But again, have your pitch ready. Think about what you can and can't do and what your value can be. I just sent you Somebody a great email. Hey, I just so said you in the chat. One, one quick thing I would like to say is that timing is very important when you are working with industry. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you are really in touch with uh, the people in terms of, you know, you're looking for work or you want to contribute, um, you have to hit the right thing at the right time to really oh, yeah. get Absolutely. If you can do that, then you are in the driver's seat. Otherwise, you know, we have already done that with someone or... And I think the other part is the, the, the results are relevant as well if they are delivered in time. So not only yeah. you get that funding in right time, but you have to get it out in the market before, you know, in that window window when, when every discussion is hot, everybody's talking about it. Then you can catch a lot of eyes and you can put a stamp on your on your team, you know, from whoever you're working with, BSF or whatever, he said, like, he's my man, you know, he's my man, whatever, like, he's my guy. So, so I think that's how the, the timing and relevancy part is is very critical. And that's that was the example I gave about the genome editing. It's hot right now, but I started thinking about it in 2016. But now it's hot. So it's, it's you know, I've, I got everything, I was ready. I had all the background information and developed this over the last two or three years. And now it's hot. And you can do the same thing if you can think strategically about what may be an interesting three to four years. I noticed that Dr. Shi so had- That means you've got to have this. You've got to be listening. I think Dr. Shi had, had his video on. I don't know, Yang Cheng, if you had a comment and we missed you. No, 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 I, I uh, somehow dropped out and then I oh. joined the, the meeting. <laughs> so okay. I, I was, uh, uh, I was here, but then somehow I dropped out. Uh, so, um, so Jerry made, made me in uh, uh, again. Gotcha. 
Good, okay. good to see you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. So I just put a quick a quick sentence in there. Know, yeah, know your purpose, do your homework, and be prepared to make a clear pitch. Be well prepared. That's really the key. I would say that's that's the number one key. Because if I'm asked by management to go at a few days' notice to a senior management meeting, that's what I've got to do. I got to be prepared, and so I got to spend the time. Yeah, you know, we did one of those. I was asked a week. I was asked to do something on a Friday. I was told on Monday I was doing it. Two of us got together. We probably spent four hours on a twenty-minute presentation. I hate to say that, but boy, it went well. <laughs> so, <laughs> any other thoughts? We've got a bit less than a minute left. I like that summary, right? That's good. Know your purpose, do your homework, and know your pitch, right? That's it. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. That's that's uh, courtesy of actually. I need to put the Emmy's, and I'll put it in the text when I get when we get back to the thing. So Emmy's contact information. He's the guy who gave me that actually. Huh. Um, I'll put it in the oh, yeah. chat. Yeah, I see it in the chat. Yep. There you go. But I'll put it in the main chat as well. Okay, okay. perfect. It's like, yeah. I don't know if I'm 10 seconds now I'm stressed if I can copy that or not. No, it's <laughs> so. okay. I'll, I'll send it to the other one. He's he's our guy, so he's a guy to talk to.